Welcome back. In the first part of this series, we uncovered the tragic consequences of malaria and typhoid misdiagnosis. I shared real life stories of patients whose lives were affected or even lost because of this widespread misconception. But the question remains, why does this happen so often? Why are malaria and typhoid so frequently linked, even though they are completely different diseases? In this video, we are diving deeper to uncover the root causes of this dangerous myth, explore the flawed tools that contribute to it, and discuss what needs to change. To understand why malaria and typhoid are so often linked, we need to look at a few factors. First, let's talk about symptoms. Both diseases can cause fever, headaches, and general body weakness. For a healthcare provider, especially one without access to advanced diagnostic tools, it can be easy to assume both are present when a patient has these overlapping symptoms. But here's the thing. While the symptoms may seem similar on the surface, they are actually quite different if you look closely. Malaria causes fever that comes and goes in cycles. White typhoid causes prolonged and continuous fever. Malaria often causes chills and sweating. White typhoid fever is more likely to be accompanied by abdominal pain or digestive issues like um, diarrhea or constipation. I remember one patient who came to me after being treated for both malaria and typhoid for over a week. They had fever and abdominal pain, but the real issue turned out to be appendicitis, a surgical condition that had been completely overlooked. This shows how critical it is to understand the nuances of symptoms. Now, how is typhoid fever usually diagnosed in most places? For most people, it starts with a blood test. This test is called the Wydal test, and it has been the go-to diagnostic tool in many places, including here. When you get a Wydal test result, it comes with multiple numbers like 140, 180, 1160, or even 1320. These numbers are actually supposed to indicate or tell you how strong the evidence is for typhoid fever in that patient. The higher the number, the more confident we are supposed to be that typhoid fever is actually present. This sounds straightforward, right? But here's the thing. These numbers don't always win what we think they mean. Imagine this, you are in a building and the fire alarm goes off. There is some smoke, so you are alerted. But you don't actually know if it is just someone burning toast in the kitchen or a full-blown house fire. That's the wider test for you. It sounds an alarm, but it doesn't give you the full picture of what is really happening. And here's where it gets even more complicated. Sometimes this fire alarm goes off even when there is no smoke at all. That's right, false alarms. It can detect typhoid when it is not actually there. Or worse, it can miss it entirely when it truly is. To understand the wider test better, we need to talk about something called antibodies. Imagine your body is a castle and harmful bacteria or viruses are intruders trying to break in. Your immune system is the army protecting the castle and antibodies are its soldiers. These soldiers are highly trained. They don't just fight the invader, but they also remember it. So if the same intruder comes back into the body in the future, your body can respond quickly and effectively. The wider test looks for these antibodies, specifically the ones your body produces to fight Salmonella typhi, the bacteria that causes typhoid fever. But here's the problem. Antibodies don't disappear immediately after an infection. They can linger in your body for weeks, months, or even years. This means you can test positive on a wider test if you don't currently have typhoid. 
you might have had it in the past or you could even get a false positive due to exposure to other bacteria that produces antibodies that look similar to the ones produced against typhoid. I was curious, so I did a little research of my own, where I spoke with several laboratory scientists and technicians who performed the wider tests on a daily basis. What they actually told me was shocking. Most of them said that more than 95% of the wider test results they get are positive. Let that sink, 95%. I also asked patients who have done the wider test on multiple locations on their own if they have ever had a wider test that came back negative. And almost all of them said never. Their wider tests are almost always positive, no matter their condition. Even more troubling, I have seen clinical, clinically normal individuals without fever or any other symptoms and they do a wider test as a form of routine checkup and their results still came back positive. Let's look at this from another angle. If typhoid, which is transmitted through contaminated food and water, is so common, why don't we see similar test results for other bacteria that are also transmitted the same way? Take um, E. coli for example. It's a bacteria found in contaminated water or food, especially under cooked meat. It can cause severe diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and in some cases, life-threatening conditions like kidney failure. There is also another bacteria called Shigella, which spreads through contaminated water or food. This bacteria is notorious for causing dysentery, which is diarrhea that is mixed with blood. But here's the catch. You don't hear about E. coli or Shigella nearly as you hear about typhoid fever. Why is that? Are these other bacteria taking a vacation? Or are we immune to them somehow? Of course not. These bacteria are very much present, but they are not falsely lighting up diagnostic tests the way typhoid does on the wider test. So far, we've explored why malaria and typhoid are often linked, even though they are completely different diseases. We've uncovered the limitations of the wider test, shared shocking findings from the lab, and raised important questions about its reliability. But here's the thing, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What about the hard data? What does scientific research really say about the wider test? And why does malaria seem to play such a big role in those false positives? In the next part of this series, we'll dive into a groundbreaking study that reveals just how flawed the wider test truly is. We'll break down the numbers, connect the dots between malaria and typhoid misdiagnosis, and explore better diagnostic options, including the gold standard test for typhoid fever. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Thank you for joining me in this second part of our series. If you found this video informative, please share it with your family, friends, and anyone who might benefit from understanding the dangers of misdiagnosis. Awareness starts with conversations, and by sharing this message, you could help someone avoid unnecessary treatments or even save a life. And I would love to hear from you. Have you or someone you know been misdiagnosed with malaria and typhoid? Drop your story in the comments below. Your experience could shed light on this critical issue. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell so you are the first to know when part 3 goes live. Together, let's break the myth and demand better diagnostic practices. Until next time, stay healthy and stay informed.